Just who are these people? Doom is such a big deal in gaming history, but looking at this list, only 18 people actually contributed to it. A tiny number compared to many studios today. Well, I'm here to tell you who these people are, what they did on Doom, and what they did afterwards. You might know some of these people, maybe not others, but I'll try to give you the down low on all of them. Oh, and I'm using the Ultimate Doom's credits because it includes the most amount of people who worked on Doom at some point. To be clear, in this video I will be covering everyone who worked on the Ultimate Doom and Doom 2 or was employed at id during that time period. Looking at the length of this video, you might notice it is extremely long. So in addition to my sources, I have timestamps for every single segment of this video below. So if there's any one person that interests you greatly that you want to hear about now, just go there. To start, there are quite a few people that I know were involved in some way with Doom that didn't make it to these credits, and let's start with them. Don Ivan Poonchatz, born on September 8, 1936, was the artist hired to create the box art for the original Doom. Before this, he was a prolific science fiction fantasy artist who created art for people like Steve Hunter, magazines like Heavy Metal, Time, and National Geographic, and for authors like Philip Jose Farmer, and even Isaac Asimov. He also managed to convince id Software to hire his son for a short period of time, but we will get to that later. Don died on October 22nd, 2009 from a cardiac arrest. While that sure is a sour note to start this video with, it is worth noting that he is the only person I will be talking about who I can confirm is deceased. <laughs> Gerald Brom, born March 9th, 1965, is one of those guys who is arguably better known for his work outside of Doom. Sure, he made Doom 2's cover, but Brom is one of the most prolific and well-known fantasy artists of the past 50 years. Not only has he worked for many commercial clients such as IBM, CNN, and Coca-Cola, Brom is best known for his other work at TSR Incorporated. Here he became one of the main artists for Dungeons and Dragons starting in 1989 and practically shaped the entire aesthetic of the Dark Sun campaign from the 90s. It's actually hard to find all of the things Brom is worked on, but rest assured he's still going. He's drawn illustrations for Magic the Gathering, DC Comics, Heresy Kingdom Come, and even two Hearthstone cards. He even drew the covers to all six books of the War of the Spider Queen book series, which take place in the very famous Forgotten Realms D&D campaign setting. The entire concept of Doom came from a D&D session at id Software where demons invaded the world, so it's no question as to why they'd want him involved. In addition to the cover for Doom 2, Brom also drew the cover for Heretic and did concept art for Heretic 2. If you like fantasy art, make sure to check this guy out. <laughs> Donna Jackson has been the office manager of id Software since the days of Wolfenstein 3D. Miss Donna, or id Mom, was a very necessary hire at the time because, despite their technical prowess, the guys at id Software were anything but organized. They also had a bad habit of literally smashing things. Here's a famous picture of them with John Romero's head in a hole in a door. Anyways, Donna is one of the only three people I will be talking about that is still working at id Software to this very day. Mike Wilson, born in 1970, didn't work at id Software for long, but was tangentially involved in the company for longer, being the Vice President of Development at Duango before joining id Software as Head of Marketing, where he coordinated marketing for the Ultimate Doom, Final Doom, and Quake. If you want to know more about Duango, I'm putting my video on the company in the description. They went places. Mike Wilson is a businessman through and through. After id, he would be CEO of Ion Storm for a year, in such time actually doing good things for that famously doomed company. He increased the amount of employees they had tenfold, and managed to convince Warren Spector to join Ion Storm. Thus, Mike was instrumental in making Deus Ex happen. But on the flip side, he also made that really infamous Daikatana advertisement. After some nasty arguments, Mike left and formed the short-lived but very famous Gathering of Developers publishing house before it was absorbed by Take-Two Interactive. At Take-Two, he made a few documentaries. He also attempted to make a magazine called Substance TV that didn't go anywhere. Mike also formed the also short-lived Gamecock Media Group in 2007. It folded in 2008. Sure there's a lot of failure here, do you kind of feel bad for Mike? Well, actually don't worry, because after Gamecock, Mike formed a company called Devolver Digital, which has been pretty successful since he formed it in 2008. <laughs> If you 
you know Doom, then Tom Hall is probably the most famous exclusion from these credits. Tom Hall, born on September 2nd, 1964, was one of the four co-founders of Ideas from the Deep software. You know, it's software. Tom was instrumental in many of id's early games in a creative sense. He was fond of world building, puzzles, cinematics, and all sorts of things that didn't end up making it into Doom. Although Tom was the original creative director for Doom, wrote Doom's design document, the Doom Bible, and worked on level design, he goes uncredited because he quit id software before Doom launched. His influence can still be heavily seen within Doom, however. The teleporters were his idea, as well as the concept of flying enemies like the Kako Demon and Lost Soul. He also petitioned to make it so doors that required colored key cards would be the color of the necessary key, an idea so good that some map makers should take note of it. He even came up with a .wad file extension. It stands for Where's All the Data, by the way. However, and unfortunately this isn't the last time we will be hearing this, disagreements with the rest of the team, in particular John Carmack, led him to leaving while Doom was in beta. He was mostly frustrated with how little the others cared about his ideas, most notably the more story-focused ones, thus leading to his departure. Remember that famous Carmack quote about porn stories being about as important as game stories? And then imagine being a writer for a game and having that philosophy being shoved on you. He also had to fight really hard to get what gameplay ideas he had into the game. After leaving it, he went straight to Apogee Software. Here he was best known for making Rise of the Triad, one of the early Doom clones that actually featured quite a bit of influence from the old Doom Bible. At Apogee, Tom Hall had a part in a number of famous games, from Terminal Velocity to Duke Nukem 3D. He also did writing for Hocus Pocus. Remember that game? On December 3rd, 1996, Tom Hall would join John Romero in founding Ion Storm in Dallas, Texas after leaving Apogee Software earlier that year. His biggest work there was the cult classic Anachronox. Oh, and he voices Walton Simmons in Deus Ex. After leaving Ion Storm in 2001, he created the Lynx game Hyperspace Delivery Boy and joined Midway Games for a few years. He spent some time at King Isle Entertainment, creators of Wizards 101. He tried to kickstart two games, but neither went through, and now Tom works at Play First, a mobile game developer. Also, he's got a really cool GDC speech with John Romero about the development of Doom I'm linking below. And how could I forget? He also created the Dope Fish. <laughs> Now, finally starting from the bottom on the actual list. John Anderson, born in 1956 and alternatively known as Dr. Sleep, was one of id's level designers hired after the release of Doom 2. Dr. Sleep got his start in the early Doom mapping scene, releasing the famous Dante's Gate and crossing Acheron Wads, which led to a direct offer of employment from id. Contributing five levels to the 21-level project Master Levels for Doom 2, he got to work on a full id project with one level for Thy Flesh Consumed. He made E4M7. He also helped publicize the Watt Editor Death, and has written support on Doom Builder. After Doom, he ended up working on Blood, Unreal, and ended up back with other id alumni working on Dai Katana. After all that pro work, he went back to Doom mapping with Waters of Leith in 2004, but it never released. Frankly, he appears to have disappeared from the internet entirely. I dug out an archived form spring post by John Romero where he stated that Dr. Sleep owed him around 10 grand, and that he was under investigation by the FBI. Others say they know he's fine and living good as of 2008. All I can say is that the reasons surrounding his sudden disappearance 2004 after being so active online will continue to be one of the Doom community's big mysteries. <laughs> Tim Willits, born in 1971, made a number of PWADs before he became a contractor for the Master Levels collection and it was impressed enough to hire him on after that. He made E4M5 and E4M9 for the Ultimate Doom. Tim would go on to have heavy influence on the level design of the Quake series, and well, he's still there. Tim Willits is actually the current director on id's latest title, Quake Champions. He's been very successful at id, but he has also managed to cause a little controversy with ex-id staff. Tim claimed that he was the man who came up with the very idea of multiplayer maps and FPSs during the development of Quake, but was dismissed by both John Carmack and John Romero, who did not like the idea. Romero completely disagreed and well rightly brought up that there were many fan-made deathmatch maps for Doom before Quake was even in active development, and that both Marathon and Rise of the Triad had multiplayer maps too before Quake. In a rare thing to see in the modern era, John Carmack commented too, saying that he agreed with Romero, and around the same time Tom Hall also showed up and corroborated Romero's side. 
Tim is not back down on this position. He also claimed to create all of Quake's shareware levels, which is so verifiably false that I won't go any further. But hey, Quake Champions is pretty fun, so I'll forgive some stupid comments if I can just have some fun. Another one of those names you probably recognize outside of Doom, American McGee, born in 1972, was originally hired as tech support by John Carmack, but by Doom 2 had become a full-on level designer. They actually met because they lived in the same apartment complex. He's credited with two of the levels in Thy Flesh Consumed, and eight levels for Doom 2. American would have a notable mark on id's level design after Doom in the first two Quake games, before being fired by John Carmack in 1998 for not meeting expectations. Then he promptly joined Rogue Entertainment, a developer known for making the cult classic Strife, and also just so happened to be stationed in the same building as its software. Here, American McGee would become a bit of a famous video game designer with the third-person action game American McGee's Alice. It's a pretty famous game, and while I haven't played it, I know quite a few people who have. Being part of the team that made Doom 2 was no small number, but this game really put American on the map. Rogue Entertainment, however, wouldn't last much longer. They died in the debacle that was Counter-Strike Condition Zero, but by that point American had already moved on to making several more games with his name attached. He joined Mercury Steam for a bit, and with them made American and McGee's Scrapland. It wasn't as well received, although Mercury Steam lives on, unlike Rogue Entertainment. They just developed Metroid Samus Returns, actually. Then came Bad Day LA. It wasn't well received. He then made the Shanghai-based development house Spicy Horse, where he developed the episodic Grimm and a number of mobile games. He even managed to bury the hatchet a bit with EA to make Alice Madness Returns. In recent years, American McGee has been living what seems to be a pretty exciting life. He's boating all around the South China Sea, running a fashion line, funding a series of Alice short films, and as of writing, he's working on a pitch for a third Alice game called Alice Asylum to send to EA, and it's all being funded by a relatively successful Patreon. Doom's a big deal, but for people like American McGee, it was just a launch pad. Now, skipping John Romero for now, Sean Green. There's an unfortunately small amount of information on Sean that I could find, but what I can say is that Sean Green was a level designer hired after the production of the original Doom. He made one map for Doom 2, map 25, and two for the ultimate Doom, E4M3 and E4M8. While the majority of id worked on Quake, Sean was tasked with managing the final Doom and master levels for Doom 2 projects. After that, he joined Ion Storm and worked as a programmer on both Daikatana and Anachronox. Then he joined Gearbox software working on such titles as Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 and the Brothers in Arms games. After that, he moved on to Escalation Studios, where he got to touch some mid-properties again by helping make Doom Resurrection, the iOS version of Doom 3, and having some minor credit in Rage. He hasn't had much in terms of credits recently, though. According to his Wikipedia page, this is because he became a Tibetan Buddhist yogi and lives in secrecy, yet citation needed. Still, I'm always curious about this sort of thing, so if you have any idea where Sean Green is, leave me a comment. Born in 1967, Gregor Poonchatz is the son of previously mentioned Don Ivan Poonchatz. Gregor is a modeling and animation guy, and his work in Doom reflects this. He personally made the models of the Mancubus, Archvile, Revenant, and the Spider Mastermind. But when he was hired, it wasn't just because he was related to Don Ivan Poonchatz. Before Doom and after Doom, he worked in Hollywood special effects. Perhaps most notable was his work on the three original Robocop movies. His work was so influential that they let him dress up as Robocop and appear in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. This footage is from his own YouTube channel, by the way. Outside of Doom, the only other game I know he worked on was Rise of the Triad, where he also did model development. After Doom, his most notable credit was being the animation director for Spy Kids 2, where he used his modeling and special effects skills to emulate the legendary Ray Harryhausen. Since 2002, though, IMD got kinda sucky at tracking him, but I did find him. Greg is now a CG supervisor at Aaron Sim Creative, a CG studio that has worked on tons of big-budget movies like It, 
Wonder Woman, Edge of Tomorrow, and Clash of the Titans, just to name a few. Before this, Greg was the Senior Creative Director at Janimation from 1993 to 2014. This company also does visual effect work for movies like Hugo, X-Men Origins Wolverine, and of course, Spy Kids 2. But they also do tons of trailer marketing for video games like Borderlands 2, Civ 4, and many others. Greg is a professional, and it's kind of a shame he is often only remembered for just Doom. Robert Bobby Prince was the composer for all variations of Doom. Bobby has had a pretty wild career. In the 60s, he helped found the R&B group The Jesters, which were a local favorite in Athens, Georgia back then. He left the band to become a lieutenant during the Vietnam War. After the war, he moved away from music to become a lawyer. This is important, remember this. After being a lawyer for a while, he became an independent contractor for game music, at first working mainly for its software. This, of course, led him to making the Doom soundtrack. Doom's music was directly inspired by 70s to 90s metal and alternative rock, which should be obvious. To be more accurate though, Prince's music guidelines were information contained in Tom Hall's Doom Bible and a couple of cassette tapes from Black Sabbath's Tony Martin era. You know, the singer they had besides Ozzy and Dio. But now for the elephant in the room. I'll be linking the evidence for this in the description, but it has become very apparent over the years that much of Doom's music is kinda sorta copied from popular metal slash grunge music from the 90s and before. Pantera, Alice in Chains, Stone Temple Pilots, Metallica, and of course Black Sabbath all had riffs or practically whole songs midified for Doom. It's even crazier when you listen to some of the unreleased and unfinished music for Doom that Romero posted not too long ago. Again, linking that too. There's literally a MIDI version of Soundgarden's Outshined in there. It's crazy. But guess what? No legal issues have ever come about for any of this, because Bobby knows what he can do. Being a lawyer first, it's very likely that things like copyright law are easily discernible to him. Well anyways, after Doom and Doom 2, he moved on from id and likely his most famous soundtrack in this time was his work on Duke Nukem 3D. Prince had a good relationship with Apogee Software and was even composing music for them before Doom's release too, with cult classics like Duke Nukem 2 and Blake Stone Aliens of Gold under his belt. He also did the music for Rise of the Triad and Axis and Allies, along with a number of much less remembered games. He took a hiatus from the gaming industry for 16 years before returning to do the sound effects and music for the 2014 FPS Rack. YouTuber MaxiVest2D also worked on that game. What he did in the interim, I'm extremely uncertain. I did find his personal blog, which he has updated sporadically since 2010. Most of the information available is for those interested in old MIDI keyboards. He did have an interesting post on copyright law, though. See, I told you he knew his stuff. Unfortunately for Prince, he was diagnosed with colon cancer in 2016. However, his brother's GoFundMe on his behalf went great, and it seems by the information featured on that GoFundMe that he is expected to make a full recovery. Although technically an outside contractor, Prince's music has proven to be an integral part of Doom's DNA, and I still like it even if it is a bit unoriginal. Paul Radek, born in 1966, was one of the contractors hired on to the Doom project. Through his company Digital Expressions, which didn't actually last that long, he created the DMX sound library that was used by the original DOS version of Doom to actually play sounds and music. It's a complicated bit of coding to get done, and certainly a job most don't really think about. Speaking of which, the DMX sound library and code has a lot of little, let's just call them, quirks to it that can cause all sorts of sound issues. Both of the Johns would end up expressing displeasure. Romero would get quite angry over Paul's failed expansion of the game's sound support, which essentially meant certain computers would have trouble playing Doom sounds or playing them wrong. Carmack's disapproval came about when the Doom source code was being released. Since Paul owned the copyright to the DMX sound library, Doom's code couldn't actually be released in full, and since Paul was unwilling to negotiate, or just didn't care to talk with id, the code for the DMX-less Linux port was released instead. Paul's work on Doom was anything but well received, but life has treated him well since Doom. His LinkedIn profile shows that he's had consistent employment in senior positions for the past 20 years, with his most recent work being sound coding for Windows 10 at Microsoft, a project that has seemingly gone better than his work on Doom. Paul Radek is certainly a reminder that not all screw-ups will kill careers. 
Jay Wilbur was one of the co-owners of id Software and pretty much the head of business stuff there while the other guys did, you know, the kind of stuff id Software did. He got his start in the 80s as an editor of the computer magazine Uptime. Here he published many of John Romero's early Apple II games, and their relationship led him to joining Softdisk. While Ideas from the Deep, a company made up of purely Softdisk employees, were secretly working on a game called Commander Keen, Wilbur supported managerial efforts on the project and even provided food for the team. After Ideas from the Deep became id Software and all left Softdisk, Jay stayed, but not for much longer. He too would end up at id replacing the original id business guy, Mark Ryan. Jay kept everyone on track until 1997 where he left along with John Romero, but he did not follow him. Jay has been at Epic Games ever since. Currently, he is their Vice President of Business and has been credited on all of Epic's games since Jazz Jackrabbit 2. He's also been thanked in several unrelated games, such as American McGee's Grimm. Oh, and the previously mentioned Mark Ryan is also a co-founder of Epic Games, so that's interesting. Sure, being Mr. Business isn't that exciting, but every company needs at least one. <laughs> Sandy Peterson, born in 1955, is another one of those guys who was absolutely known for things outside of Doom. Born in Missouri, he went to college in California, and when there, he developed an obsession with Dungeons and Dragons, much like the other id guys. But by being a bit older, Sandy was able to strike while the iron was hot, and land a job with the new tabletop company Chaosium in the 70s. Founded by famous game designer and real-life shaman Greg Stafford, Chaosium did, and does, put out a lot of cult classic tabletop games. On the off possibility that anyone watching this was a nerdy teenager in the 70s, a lot of this may come off as obvious. One of their games, Super Quest, eventually inspired a series of books edited by George R. R. Martin and written by him and his friends. Anyways, Sandy. Sandy Peterson is the principal game designer behind Chaosium's most remembered and loved work, The Call of Cthulhu. Based on the Lovecraft story of the same name, this tabletop game is often considered one of the major reasons why the Cthulhu mythos has become so well known. Sandy's version of the Cthulhu Mythos is probably the most famous one adaptation as well, and Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu RPG license has been adapted into other tabletop games, phone games, card games, and yes, also, Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth, one of YouTube's favorite cult classic video games. After Call of Cthulhu, he worked on a few more tabletop games before jumping to the video game industry and joining Microprose. Here he made a very notable name for himself with senior positions on games like Sid Meier's Pirates, Sword of the Samurai, and Lightspeed. Although things were going good there, he was so blown away by Wolfenstein 3D he decided to join id Software, who were only a few months away from releasing Doom was a bit too late to work on things like code, but that was okay for a guy like Sandy. He worked quickly on creating tons of levels for the final game. Literally all of Episode 3 was done by him. He then finished off many of the levels Tom Hall started, which also gives him credit in every mission of Episode 2. Sandy was exactly the kind of guy it needed at the time. After Doom, Sandy would, of course, stay for Quake. There's no way he's going to miss out on a Lovecraft-inspired game. But much how Quake quickly left that idea behind, Sandy did too with its software. Inspired to move yet again by another new up and coming studio, Sandy moved to Ensemble Studios after Doom. Here he had a hand in all of the Age of Empires games, with a notable senior design position on the first game's expansion pack, The Rise of Rome. After contributing to Halo Wars Ensemble with The Way of the Dodo in 2009, and Sandy had to leave. And where did he go? Well, he went and made a company of his own, Green Knight Games. They made the Cthulhu Wars board game, which made almost 1.5 million on Kickstarter. While successful, the follow-up Kickstarter for a video game called Cthulhu World Combat was not successful at all, and Green Knight Games became just Peterson Games. Sandy also made his way back to Chaosium recently. Looking at the Peterson Games website, which is supposed to be both his personal site and store, it strikes out to me that Doom, or any of his other video game work for that matter, is never mentioned. I guess to Sandy, his huge contributions to strategy and first-person shooter video game design are his smaller accomplishments. <laughs> 
Kevin Cloud, born in 1965, was Adrian Carmack's assistant artist during the production of Doom. We will get to Adrian in a moment. Much like many of his co-workers, Kevin worked at Softdisk. He started working there while attending LSU Shreveport in 1985. He was not involved with Commander Keen, and was convinced by Romero in 1992 to join id during the development of Wolfenstein 3D. Don't be fooled by the assistant artist title, making him seem unimportant. In Doom, Kevin's art can actually be seen constantly. Not only is the environmental art mostly done by him, but Doom Guy's hands are really digitized and modified pictures of his hands. Kevin would follow up his Doom work with essentially doing the same job in Quake, which is a project he is personally very proud of. Then he did art for Quake 2, and Quake 3, and Doom 3. Oh yeah, by the way, Kevin is one of those few that stayed. In fact, by the time id was bought by ZeniMax Media in 2009, he actually co-owned the company and is now credited as an executive producer. For the most recent Doom, he worked heavily on the snap map feature. Kevin has also been a producer for other projects just outside of id Software, being an executive producer on the 2009 Wolfenstein game and 1997's Hexen 2, the last game published by id. If you want to know more about the guy and his more recent work, I'll be linking below an interview he did with the amazing Noclip group. Just because he wasn't the most famous member of the team doesn't mean he wasn't one of the most important. <laughs> Adrian Carmack, born on May 5th, 1969, was another one of the co-founders of id Software, and for many years was their main artist. Unrelated to John Carmack, Adrian is responsible for a lot of Doom's darker art. Growing up was kinda tough for Adrian. He was a quiet boy, and things got worse when his father died when Adrian was only 13. As a teenager, he got a job at the local hospital photocopying pictures taken of patients, often patients with rough diseases or those already dead. He even showed his friends these pictures as he took quite a liking to them. For experience in art, his most favorite subject, and because it paid better, Adrian joined Softdisk as an intern where he learned how to make digital art. Of course, then you know the rest. He met up with the guys and founded its software with them. Not much of a gamer, Adrian nevertheless had a great deal of enjoyment in making art for the Doom series and later Quake as well. The term jibs was coined by him too. He actually stayed quite a while at id, not leaving until 2005. This is where things get kinda messy though. When he left, it was initially reported that he had simply decided that games weren't his thing anymore, and that from now on he'd focus on his art only. But nope. It wasn't so simple. According to the Wall Street Journal, he was fired and was taking id to court for forcing him to sell his 41% stake in the company for significantly less than it was worth, and that he wanted the courts to nullify this sale and give him the approximately $43 million he was more accurately owed. This was after Activision gave id $105 million in an attempt to buy the company. While I cannot find whether or not he actually won this case, nine years later he bought the Heritage Golf and Spa Report in Killinard, Ireland for, according to the sellers, significantly more than its 5.5 million euro asking price. Just recently, Adrian went back to work on games by joining Nightwork Games to work on Black Room, the first-person shooter directed by John Romero, who you know I will be talking about soon. There was a Kickstarter, but it was cancelled in order to relaunch it with a demo. As of writing, there is no such demo, but I'm sure we can look forward to some more good dark Carmack art when it comes around. <laughs> Dave D. Taylor was a programmer who worked on Doom's code along with John Romero and John Carmack. He was not a former member of Softdisk, unlike the others, and would be at id from 1993 to 1996. All I know about him prior to his tenure is that he worked at a kernel debugging firm called The Kernel Group, a job he instantly quit once he received a job offer from id Software. Dave filled in the blanks when it came to coding. While Romero worked on the level editor and while doing a bunch of other non-coding things, and while John Carmack was revolutionizing the idea of game engines, Dave did all sorts of small things that were necessary for the game. The auto map, the level transitions, cheat codes, and the chat system were all made by Dave. He also did something that, in the long run, would prove to be extremely important. Remember when I was talking about Paul Radek's copyright that was keeping Doom's code from going public? It was Dave's Linux port that ended up being released. Without Linux Doom, written by Dave Taylor, we would not have Chocolate Doom, Z Doom, or many other source ports. Thanks man, my Doom mod videos wouldn't have been possible otherwise. 
Dave was also known for being a bit of an eccentric personality at id. Famously, once Doom's success rolled in, he bought himself a brand new Acura NSX. Also, during Doom's late development, he found himself quite a fan of the game he was helping to create, often playing the game so much for so long he would pass out on the floor instead of going home for the day when he was done. The other guys would place tape around his body as if it were a crime scene. He was later bought a couch to pass out on. After leaving Quake was released, he founded the development house Crack.com. They only put out one game, it's now a cult classic, I've been saying that a lot haven't I, and it's called Abuse. It's a platform slash shooter and its code is now in the public domain. And of course, it does have a Linux port. Crack.com then worked on a game called Golgotha, but they folded before its completion. Since then, Dave has done plenty of small projects. He's worked at a handful of studios, but mostly makes his living these days as a Linux game porter. He also ended up selling that car in 2008. His bare bones website states that he currently has no car, phone, or TV. Oh, and that he's insufferable because he's vegan. The more you read about Dave, the more you realize he has a pretty strong sense of humor. It also states he's working on VR, game development, and business development, so even though I can't find much, it still seems that this id alumni still has plenty of work. Oh boy, time for the big one. John Romero, born on October 28, 1967, was one of the co-founders of id Software, and is very famously known as the Doom design guy, although he is also a programmer. Romero first made his name in the Apple II scene in the 80s as a teenager. From what I found, he's been programming games since, no joke, 1979, first starting at school computer labs. His work frequently appeared in the Apple II magazine Nibble, and his success landed him a job at Origin Systems in the late 80s working on the game Space Rogue, directed by Paul Newarth. Space Rogue would serve as a precursor to the Wing Commander series, by the way. Anyways, Paul was impressed with Romero's work and invited him to join his new company, Blue Sky Productions, but Romero declined. It's worth noting that Blue Sky Productions would eventually become Looking Glass Technologies, developer of such games as Thief, System Shock 2, and the two Ultima Underworld games. Instead, Romero founded his own company, Inside Out Software, and worked on porting games to the Apple II. Sometime later, he and a friend founded Ideas from the Deep, a company also porting to the Apple II that wouldn't last long, but I think you know that the name would end up being reused. Joining Softdisk in 1989, Romero was responsible for getting all the other co-founders of id Software together. While working on the Big Blue Disc magazine, he hired John Carmack to work full-time instead of the freelancing he was doing, moved Adrian Carmack into his division, and convinced older employee Tom Hall to help him with game design. Then, of course, came id Software. Some of the specific programming tasks Romero accomplished at id were writing the Doom level editor, setup program, Deathmatch Launcher, Dwango Client, and the iGrab Wad Asset Compiler. He also coined the term Deathmatch and is the final boss of Doom 2. But of course, Romero is best known for his design contributions. Besides being a literal level designer for many of Doom's levels, the basic idea of Doom, being a fast-paced demon kill and shooter with brutal gore, was of his design. His love of Japanese fighting games that he shared with his team likely led to Doom's focus on multiplayer too. Also fun fact, within hours of Doom's December 10th, 1993 release, several university networks across America had already banned Doom multiplayer matches for fear of overloading their systems. Romero would of course work on Doom 2 and The Ultimate Doom as well, but also during this time he was the executive producer for both Heretic and Hexen. His last game at id would be the original Quake. Major disagreements over its design with John Carmack led to Romero resigning his position from id right after the game released. Not long after, Romero formed Ion Storm with Tom Hall. Romero's big project here was called Daikatana. Due to an engine switch and feature creep and many developers leaving with Mike Wilson to go to gathering of developers, Daikatana would come out three years late and to almost universal negativity. At this point, Romero had earned quite the negative reputation for himself in the industry. Known for racing Ferraris, hiring his at the time girlfriend slash pro gamer slash playboy model, yes seriously, Stevie Case as a game designer, and obviously for that one terrible ad, his image became 
became quite stained. But Romero never quit working. After quitting Ion Storm after Anachronox finished up development, Romero formed Monkey Stone Games with Tom Hall and girlfriend Stevie Case. Hyperspace Delivery Boy was their first game made for the Pocket PC, and they later made the N-Gage version of Red Faction. Stevie and Romero broke up in 2003, and with that came most of his involvement with Monkey Stone Games, although he did stay around long enough to get some work in on the shooter Area 51. After bouncing around Midway Games for a bit, he founded another studio, Loot Drop, and here he actually made himself another small fortune. Teaming up with Brenda Brathwaite, a veteran game designer who honestly could use a video of her own, she's done tons, they created the game Ravenwood Fair in 2010. You've probably never heard of it, but it was extremely popular on Facebook circa 2011, peaking at around 25 million players, although it was shut down in 2013 and is no longer available. John and Brenda were married in 2012, and together they founded Romero Games Limited, a subsidiary of which is Nightwork Games, who are currently working on Blackroom, the game I mentioned previously that Adrian Carmack is also working on. Romero's most recent game, however, is one he made with his son Donovan called Gunman Taco Truck. Something you need to know about Romero is that there is so, so much information on him. Not only is he important in game history, which attracts attention, but he's a very public person who has given innumerable interviews and answered even more fan questions. What I just told you is only a basic understanding of his life. He has made tons of Game Jam games, made a personal series of platformers called Dangerous Dave, worked for a game magazine, has published all sorts of Doom trivia, and also made more Doom maps. Yes, recently Romero made two more maps for Doom. Tech Gone Bad and Phobos Mission Control were released over 20 years after Doom 2, but boy are they fun. I've been playing them in the background during this segment. If there's anything I said that brings up questions in your mind, check out my sources like his extensive blog or, I don't know, ask him. My only question is, where is Blackroom? I kinda desperately want to play it. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> Micah Brash is an interesting fellow. If you're an uber nerd, his name might sound familiar. If you're a casual Doom fan, you probably know nothing about him. Mike is a coding pioneer in the realm of computer graphics and code optimization. He is personally known for his books from the 90s called The Zen of Assembly Language, where he talks about coding and assembly. A process I have heard from my more coding savvy friends is extremely difficult. Before Doom, Mike published several games in the very early days of the IBM PC, often clones of much more famous games. His work got him noticed by Microsoft, where he did critical graphics code for Windows NT 3.1. During this time, he was frequenting a message board also frequented by one John Carmack. They hit it off due to obviously shared interests, and Mike was very impressed with Doom's alpha builds. Years later, they met in Bellevue, where Carmack shared his new project with him, Quake, and the kind of coding he was going at. Mike was impressed, and decided to join id Software for a short period of time to help code true 3D rendering in the Quake engine. Now you may be asking yourself, so what did he do on Doom? And the answer is nothing. It just so happened that while he was doing this preliminary coding work for Quake, the ultimate Doom was about to ship, so he was included in the credits as a friendly gesture, and also because much of Doom's video code was directly inspired by techniques Mike created. Mike later worked on the team that made the original Xbox, then left to join Rad Game Tools, creators of Bink Video, and then he ended up at Intel. Here, along with another coder named Mike Sartain, he designed Intel's Larrabee microarchitecture. This is a topic so complex you can make a two-hour documentary out of it, but the short of it is that Larrabee was originally supposed to be a microarchitecture for discrete GPUs, like the ones AMD and Nvidia make, and several id Software-related tech demos were made for this platform. But this ended up not working out, and the tech was repurposed as a coprocessor in 2010. Shortly thereafter, Mike joined Valve after being personally requested many times to join by founder Gabe Newell. Then came another invitation to meet from one John Carmack again. As a celebration for the 15th anniversary of Quake, they met, and Carmack excitedly talked to him about his new obsession, VR. They kept in touch, and in 2014, Mike joined Oculus VR as their chief scientist, and he remains there today. And now, finally for the man that brought him there, and so much more. John Carmack, born on August 20th, 1970, was one of the co-founders of id Software and creator of all sorts of coding stuff I'm too stupid to understand. Growing up in the Kansas City area, Carmack was obsessed with computers from a young age, like 
really, really obsessed. When he was 14, desperate for an Apple II, he ganged up with some other kids to steal an Apple II from his school. He almost succeeded too, using his brain power to come up with a substance made of thermite Vaseline that melted the school's windows, only failing when an accomplice instead opened the window, setting off the alarm. During college, he was hired as a freelancer by Softdisk to work on the Softdisk GS publication and Apple II GS magazine. This is what introduced him to John Romero and the other founders of id, like I mentioned earlier. According to him, at this point he thought John Romero was the coolest programmer he had ever met, and was envious of the dozens of games he had managed to already put out. Once id got together, the 21-year-old Carmack finally got to flex his coding muscles by coding the raycasting engine used by Wolfenstein 3D, but with Doom, Carmack was able to accomplish something even more impressive. Using a coding technique called binary space partitioning, which he learned about in the book Computer Graphics, Principles and Practice, Carmack made the best looking real-time rendered 3D world in video games at that time. It is worth mentioning that before this point, binary space partitioning only existed in theory. He did all this while also coding all sorts of other things into the Doom engine, you know, damage, rudimentary AI, teleporters, floating enemies, and all sorts of stuff like that. This was while eating Domino's pizza every single day, a habit Carmack would keep up for the rest of his tenure at id Software. Carmack would go on to be the main tech guy at id for two more decades after Doom, and also a bit of a public persona for the company. On one day, he'd be revolutionizing how video games handle shadows, and then the next day attending a Quake tournament giving out a Ferrari. Shadow volume, mega textures, and surface caching are all game engine technologies invented or pioneered by John Carmack. In addition to his engine-related exploits, Carmack is arguably one of the most famous proponents of open source software. He's contributed to OpenGL, and as you probably know, has made all the code of all id engines through idtech4 open source. There's also the fun story of when, in 1997, Quake's source code was leaked and made into a Linux source port. When a programmer sent the Linux files to Carmack, he ordered the rest of id software to work on an official Linux port based on these files instead of pursuing any legal action. Just another little fun fact was that when Carmack was getting married in 2000, he got a personal request from Steve Jobs to postpone the wedding so he could attend that year's Macworld Expo. Carmack declined. His wife, Catherine Anna Kang, would later be the director on id's only Nintendo DS game, Orcs and Elves. He also does often interact with fans. My favorite instance is when, in 2009, he went to the Doom World forums to discuss the upcoming iOS port of Doom and what features it should have in seeking ideas from the fans. While at id, Carmack took his money to create another company, Armadillo Aerospace. It is a company dedicated to creating rockets that will lead to consumer space travel. For years, this company was relatively successful until a few flights that didn't go quite as planned led to the company entering hibernation in 2013 and having having all of its assets sold. 2013 was a big year for Carmack because it was also the year he resigned from id Software to join Oculus VR as their CTO, a position he still holds today. However, much like with Adrian Carmack, legal issues soon sprouted in what is now a very famous case. Zenimax vs. Oculus is a complicated case, but the short of it was that Zenimax, orders of id Software, claimed that any and all VR research and tech made by Carmack while he was at id Software was the intellectual property of Zenimax, and that Carmack took these things to Oculus and helped them create the tech that impressed Facebook and led to them buying Oculus for $2 billion. While not included at first, Zenimax later directly made Carmack a defendant in the case along with the previously named companies Oculus and Facebook, as well as Oculus co-founders Palmer Lucky and Brendan Iribe. This was a big, big case. Zenimax was seeking $2 billion in compensation and an additional $4 billion in punitive damages. Carmack was lucky. In the end, the courts ruled that he did not have to pay a cent and that he did not steal any of Zenimax's trade secrets, although his co-workers weren't so lucky, due to them breaking some pretty big NDAs. In total, Zenimax won $500 million from Oculus slash Facebook and swears to this day that Carmack really did steal trade secrets, although that is not what the court ruled. This was all decided just a year ago, by the way. Out of this case came two more lawsuits. 
Carmack is now suing ZeniMax over an unpaid $22.5 million that he was never paid to him when ZeniMax bought id Software. And ZeniMax is suing Oculus again over the Samsung Gear VR, which Oculus developed. Again, claiming the tech behind it was at least partially developed at id Software with John Carmack. Despite legal troubles, today Carmack stands yet again at the forefront of a fledgling revolution in computer graphics. Time will only show if he does for VR what he did for 3D games in the 90s, and his time in the spotlight probably isn't done yet. Hey there, thanks for watching. Seriously, I'm surprised anyone would be able to stand one of my videos for this long. But even then, it was an exciting effort to do something like this, and I hope that you learned at least something new watching this. I know I did making it. I've got some more videos if you're interested, but if not, see you soon.